sorry, this is a newer um, piece. I'll just read two, I think they're both kind of short. Um, <coughs> but this is an excerpt from something longer I'm working on, it's the beginning, so I don't think you need any context. Uh, in the dark, towns from a distance all look the same. Lights blur together and make your eyes twitch as you try to make out the details. If you're really far away, then it is hard to even tell how tall the buildings are. They appear simply as foggy lines of light bleeding into one another. All around us was darkness, a kind of darkness I forgot could exist until I came back to the desert. The lights from the town below had no effect on the visibility up here. It is a strange sensation to see so much light in the distance and not be able to see your own hands out in front of you. I forgot that a sky could be this dark. I remember being a child and having the overwhelming sensation as darkness grew nearer that something violent and ominous was making its approach as if it was consuming all that was living in order to penetrate the sky. I slept with a nightlight until I was 13. This was something that my stepfather would tease me about any chance he could get. Now, as an adult, I think that one must have a lot of unresolved shit if they need to make a child feel worse about themselves in order to feel superior. Are you ready, Sabine? Howling woman asks me as her voice sounds and her voice sounds like she has smoked a million packs of cigarettes in her life, but she smells like play and burnt sage, not cigarettes. I guess so. I can't see her face and this bothers me. When she told me she had this idea, that it was one of her specialties actually, I thought maybe she was fucking with me. In this darkness, I can't confirm whether she is serious or if I will one day make a great story for her to tell the salty dogs at the tavern as she sips whiskey. The air between us moves and a clicking noise sparks light between us as she brings the flame of her Zippo to the large bundle of sage in front of her. I see only the flame and the sage at first until my eyes adjust and I can make out her deep leathery jowls and the feathers hanging from her ears. Howling woman wears a long flowing white dress that looks like the kind of thing a recovering accountant might wear after a bad divorce. I don't know if she is divorced or not. When she talks about her past, it is always lovers and partners and good friends. I have never heard her say husband or boyfriend or old man, but the way she talks about her past sounds like it exists in sections marked by loves gone wrong. Maybe this is why I have entrusted a woman who performs as, Janis Joplin, as a Janis Joplin impersonator at the Double Eagle on weeknights with fixing my life. We share in common that our histories are marked by the men we no longer can love. You can remove your clothes now, she says. Her eyes are slits and she doesn't seem to be making the details of the moment to share the, with the double eagle patrons in the future. Okay, I can hear the sound come out of my mouth, but I don't recognize it as having come from me. She turns away from me and begins uh, lighting long pillar candles. The desert landscape is illuminated with each spark of the lighter, the indigo, the indigo mountains, the gray green earth, the pit where I will soon be cleansed. I pull my hoodie over my head. The air meets my bare skin with a sharp bite as if it has grown teeth in the night. My hair is the longest it's ever been, and it tickles my bare breast as it falls from my hoodie. Naked in the night, in front of another, I'm aware of how slight my frame has become since leaving California. I can feel my long brown hair floating in the wind atop my chest, and it isn't hard to imagine my body following suit. Maybe I can get out of this whole ordeal by simply floating away. It can't be impossible for a human to float away, can it? Howling woman is ch chanting in mumbled tones, and I can't tell if she is speaking in a language unfamiliar to me or if she is simply grunting from the exertion of so much energy. She is so serious. Her eyes are closed and her body is like an accordion folding and extending in front of me as she makes the sage smoke dance towards me in thick waves. It is hard to imagine that this is the same woman that wears a yellowing terry cloth robe around the casita and plucks her chin hairs with the bathroom door wide open. I've spent most every night for the last five weeks drinking boxed wine with this woman and talking about the salty dogs from the Double Eagle and listening to her tell me stories <coughs> of when she went to San Francisco and lived out of some lover's van. She tells me stories about dumpster diving and hustling and she never seems to be ashamed or showing off. Just states it all as if she is reading from a history book. I haven't told her much, just enough to lead us here. I think she can tell that I am broken. Maybe she doesn't think she is fixing me, though. Maybe we both know that is impossible, not for either of us. Are you ready? She asks, looking right through me. Why not? I say, and I step down into the pit and stumble into her as the gravel slips beneath my feet. She smiles, and for a second, I think she is going to laugh and say the whole thing is a hoax, but instead she embraces me. 
Her body feels fleshy and young around me, and I'm aware of how my bones cut into her. She doesn't seem to notice my sharp edges. I wonder if she really can fix me. I haven't told her about John. I haven't told her about Avery. I sure as hell haven't told her about Shiloh. The three great loves of my life, all of them have very real titles. None of them will ever see me again. I wonder if tonight will become another night I try to forget ever happened. So that's the beginning of like a longer piece. I'll just give you that. And then, and then uh, this is a short story uh, that I've been working on for a while, and I think maybe now, after like a million edits, it's kind of somewhere where it's done, so we'll see. Uh, it's called Looking for Ways to Touch. The man she is thinking about is not her husband. She cannot seem to stop thinking about this man, despite having tried in a variety of ways to think of something, anything, other than this man. He is a regular at the bar where she works. He drinks gin when he is dieting and whiskey when he isn't. She has not yet figured out how gin is better for dieting than whiskey. Other than his choice of beverage, she has not previously thought much of this man. There are lots of assholes that go into the bar where she works. He is not one of them, and this gives her a feeling of relief every time it is him that walks through the front door and not an asshole. She is married, nine years. This makes up a significant percentage of her life. Before now, the only man she had thought about seriously was her husband. He is a good man. He kisses her forehead as they read beside each other in bed at night and folds her underwear neatly before putting them in the drawer beside her socks. Before she married her husband, she had never folded her underwear. When her thoughts shift to the image of the man that is not her husband and that she is most definitely not supposed to be thinking about, she forces herself to remember that love looks like your underwear folded gently by another person. One. It starts like this. It is pouring rain and the small bar where she works is flooded. She has never worked in a flooded space before and her boss is a busy man who owns three other bars in the city and she does not want to call and bother him with bad news. Instead, she finds a shovel in the crawl space above the bar and pulls it down. The regular walks in to find her shoveling rainwater off the floor and into a mop bucket. Her pants are rolled up to her knees and she can feel her hair sticking to the sweat on her face. He laughs when he sees her. She looks up at this regular, frustrated with her, his laughter, and before she can open her mouth to make a snide remark, she notices something about his face she has not noticed before. He has two deep dimples that mark the ends of his smile like a line segment. She imagines herself dropping the shovel at her feet to free her fingers so that she can press them into the empty spaces around his lips. This thought creates an uncertain sensation in her body. She feels warm and floaty, which is nice, but also she feels as if she is going to be sick. Both of these feelings are overshadowed by her desire to press her fingers into his face. Two. In front of her bathroom mirror the next morning, she finds herself examining the curves of her own face. She does not know if after nearly a decade of marriage, her husband finds these dips and curves appealing. She tries to imagine what her face must look like to the regular from the bar. She does not think she is bad looking. Her lips are round and soft. Her nose is large, beak-like but she imagines the regular would like this quality of her face. Her eyes are wide and brown, and she imagines that they must sparkle the amber color of whiskey when the light hits them just right. She pulls out an old mascara tube from her dusty makeup bag to paint her lashes. If their eyes lock from across the bar, he might find himself transfixed with her dark lashes. The weight of them might be enough to propel his hand toward her face. Sometimes he watches her while she works. She wonders if he has ever thought about what it would feel like if she were to cup his face in her own hands. Three. At the Christmas party, he is holding a whiskey neat when she trips into him. He isn't drinking gin, which must mean that he isn't dieting, which must also mean that he is practicing less self-control than usual. He is a respectable sort of guy, and she finds it hard to imagine that he would do the things she wants him to do to her, seeing as she is married and all. But maybe now that he is presumably in a stage of less restraint, he might be willing to at least consider doing these types of things to her. When she trips, an intentional trip of course, his chest is the place where she allows her hands to land. She can feel his heart beating through the fabric of his shirt. She can feel her own heart begin to race in her chest. The blood pumping through her body feels heavy in her veins and the weight of it flushes her groin and chest and cheeks. She wants to know what his chest feels like without fabric covering it. She wants to slip her fingers beneath the, between the skin and underwear to feel for wetness. She wishes, she wishes he would do this for her. He doesn't. 
She knows without reaching what her body has done for. When he is sitting at the bar and it is slow, she finds herself leaning towards him to talk. She learns that his mother died of cancer just last year. He was married once. He was destined to be a basketball star until his knees blew out and he had to have semi-regular restorative surgeries in order just to walk. She tells him she has never seen the ocean and that one day she would like to. She tells him about the time she wrecked her car and killed some, someone as a teenager. Their conversations are interrupted by waves of customers. He whispers jokes about the tourists when she bends over to dry the glasses in front of where he sits. On the rare days he doesn't come into the bar, she catalogs the customers that swim in and out. The woman with the Pomeranian between her breasts, the principal with the wedding band who met a dominatrix and left on a leash, the teenager who tried to show a library card in place of an ID. She's collecting stories in order to have a reason to talk to him. She should be telling her husband these stories, but she imagines that he has heard enough of these stories to last a lifetime. Five. One day, when it is raining, the regular is the only customer at the bar all day. He sits across from her for most of her shift, and they tell each other stories that they have collected. When he gets up to leave, she feels her heart get heavy. Her muscles preemptively begin to weaken at his inevitable departure. She realizes suddenly that she does not want to be alone. She wants him to reach across the bar and touch her hand. She wants him to put his chapped lips on her cheek so she can feel his whiskey warm breath. He doesn't do this. He does write something down in the corner of his receipt paper before tearing it off and handing it to her. It is small, the smallest sheet of paper to have ever held a piece of information, she thinks. She can hardly make out the seven numbers that he has written down. At home, while her husband is doing dishes, and later when he is taking a shower, she pulls out a small sheet of paper and rubs her fingers across it. There is a sinking feeling in every part of her body, and she can feel the embodiment of emptiness hollow her out. She thinks that maybe joining her husband in the shower might make her feel full again. She does not join him. She is afraid that the feeling of loneliness will still be there, even as her husband shampoos her hair. She encloses her fingers around the small sheet of paper as if it is an infant's hand, soft, delicate, warm, full of hope. Five. The next week, the regular sits watching her as she takes off her apron at the end of her shift. She is supposed to be going somewhere after work. She cannot remember where. She vaguely recalls that it is somewhat important. She recalls that she had been looking forward to going to this place. The regular is at the bar and she is off and there's an empty seat beside him. It is so close to him. If she sits down in that empty seat, she will be able to feel the heat coming off of his body. She searches her brain for the part that will remind her of where she is supposed to be. She sits in the empty seat. He smiles. She sees his dimple. It is a nice dimple, but she has already noticed it before. What she notices now that she has not noticed before are the crow's feet around his eyes. She has never thought about why these delicate lines refer to a bird's claw, but next to him, she can imagine the glossy black bird stepping across his face and christening him with the impression of its claws, as if it had chosen him as its canvas. Below these lines are shallow pockmarks. She imagines that they came from adolescence. She can envision him surrounded by weed smoke in his parents' basement, though she has never been to his parents' house or even the city where it is located. Still, she imagines him with the mullet and weed smoke and acne his chewed down fingers working their way across the topography of his face. She has the same shallow spaces on her right cheek. She traces them with her own hands and imagines them catching on the stubble of his beard or that his calloused hands have replaced her own and are caressing her wounds. He clings his glass against hers and she forgets that there is anywhere else she needs to be.